Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew, and I want to welcome back to the show an awesome guest, Mr. Matthew LaCroix. He always shares some amazing and awesome information with us. How are you tonight, Matthew? I'm great. It's, it's fantastic, pretty much perfect weather here right now. It's a bright, um, bright sun and blue sky and nice and dry dew points, so I'm, I'm really enjoying um, you know, that we have a long period of time to wait for spring, so once we get there, it's really nice to, to, to finally enjoy it. Well, I'm glad you're having good weather over there. It's uh, storming over here, pretty much flooded, so um, <laughs> enjoy that while it lasts. Where are you located? In, in, I'm in, in uh, South Louisiana right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did, actually, we just, this weather is only here because we had a really powerful cold front go through yesterday, and we had some really intense thunderstorms, too. Now, speaking of crazy weather, there's so much going on right now. We've got volcanoes going off. Um, not only, you know, Kilauea, Guatemala, there's a new one in Costa Rica, uh, Mexico. The climate is just, the weather's going crazy all over the globe. And last time we briefly spoke about uh, the possibilities of outside stellar influence in Planet Nine. Let's talk a little bit about that. You've been doing some research. Absolutely. And so if you're someone who doesn't look at this stuff at all and you're just watching TV, you're, you're being told that this is, this is purely global warming based on human's impact, right? We have screwed up the climate and well, look what you did. And now we have all these, you know, the ice caps melting and the, and the flooding that's going on and, and all these volcanoes. Well, it must, it's all human induced because they're not really telling people the real truth. They're not telling people the cause of, of why this is happening. And, and that shouldn't be surprising to many who study this, considering the fact that if they did tell people the truth of what's going on, there would be quite a few people who would panic and freak out. Um, right. Because people don't want to hear those, those fearful things. And, they, and they, so they, they've this idea that humans are completely 100% responsible for everything that's going on is not true. I like to think of it as, um, if, if the earth is like a hornet's nest, um, we're, we're like those bees that are just aggravating it or, or, or other bees are aggravating the nest. You know, we're just, we're aggravating something that's already happening. And these are part of natural cycles. That, and we're going to talk about why they're happening though. And the timing of, of what's going on right now. So if, if people are not aware, um, I highly recommend, uh, Chris has, has a great, um, He's got a, a great consistency for following these events that are going across the world. Forbidden News on Facebook, Chris? Forbidden Knowledge News. Thank you. Yes. Forbidden yes. Knowledge. And you and I, I check it out all the time because you're really on top of um, a lot of the things that are going on in the world right now with both flooding, volcanoes, earthquakes, a lot of the bizarre stuff. And when you start actually looking at it and you look at norms and, and what and climatology and the things that are supposed to happen, you see some very strange anomalies. Like for instance, there's been videos from Yemen to Saudi Arabia to um, all the way across the, the country to places in Central America. These, these places that, um, especially in these desert regions, that just never see these, these, this type of weather with this, this extreme flooding and, um, and all of this bizarre weather. There's videos showing um, epic flash flooding going through some of these desert areas, and I've never seen anything that extreme. And at the same yeah. time, it's amazing. there's all kinds of video showing these huge cracks opening up all over the world, especially in Africa where the Rift Valley is. We're talking cracks that, you know, you could fall into and nobody ever, would ever see you again. It's, it's alarming because if we look at just over the, you know, over – our lifespans, and if you look before, this has never happened in this current time period that we're in. This has not happened for thousands of years. What is going on right now is part of a, um, a cyclical cycle that's part of, we could call it um, being influenced from something that we're going to talk about in a second here. And there's, there's many factors. It's not just one thing that's causing this. It's several that are coming in conjunction. Now, you mentioned early on the show, we just had we have obviously everybody knows there's unprecedented volcanic um, eruptions going on in, in parts of Hawaii, as well as some really enormous volcanoes um, 
in Mexico and in you said in Guatemala, like you said in Guatemala and, and in, in many other places in the world, Japan and the Philippines and oh. th there's a there's I think there's something like over 20 active volcanoes right now in the world. Well, and right now there is actually 39 erupting right at this moment. Isn't that amazing? So call it 40, yeah. 40 active volcanoes right now. And that's, that is not normal. That's right. highly unusual. It's usually you, about 10 to 20, maybe on average, it, it might spike up a little bit from here to there. That's right. But for all of this to be happening at the same time, all over the tectonic um, ring of fire and all over these areas of the world, it, you need to you st start taking notice of this. And one of the ways that's, uh, the best way to keep and monitor this is there's really um, awesome free uh, seismic and volcanic um, apps that are out there for your phone. And you can set it up so whenever there's an earthquake of a certain magnitude, say I, I set it up for anything over a 4.0, it'll right. let you know wherever it is in the world. And when you have that and you start seeing, and if you're someone who, who just watches the mainstream news, you'll, you'll be shocked to see that most of these major earthquakes is, you know, that are not causing massive human damage are not even being talked about. You know, you have this, you know, 6.5 in like somewhere in the middle of off Indonesia or something. It doesn't cause a tsunami. Nobody hears about it. But why is that important? Well, over the last six months, and I've actually done a couple of videos on this. If you look at, this, at what's been going on with the seismic readings across the earth, they've been, they've been all leading, leading up to what we, where we are right now. You could clearly see that it was coming, not only from studying some of the, the past events, if you look at historical records, but looking at this lead in to this instability. You don't just have the world go nuts with volcanoes with, with nothing leading up to it. You don't have the climate get all disrupted without something leading up to it. There's always, there's always warning signs and there's always things that are preceded that then if, if you logically know what to look for, you can say, oh my gosh, this is... This is, this is pro probably going to happen soon. And one of those things that we have to realize is that what is going on right now, volcanically, seismically, and climatologically, is all connected, and it's only going to get worse. And this isn't a fear-mongering. I don't think there's going to be widespread destruction all over the earth, and I do not think that humanity is going to be brought to the very edge of its knees. But I do think that we're going to go through a very challenging time. And, there, and there's going to be places that are highly impacted in this. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, I did some recent videos where I talked about um, SAIs, which are stratosphere of aerosol injections. And of course, yeah. people say the word chemtrail and a lot of people roll their eyes because they don't think yes. they're real. Except if you were to study clouds and, and climate and just even have a basic understanding of it, you you can quickly separate when you see a commercial plane with, with a, um, an air molecule, water molecule um, trail in the back disappear versus these crossings of these overlaid aerosols sprays that are being put down in the upper atmosphere that then that then connect and create these enormous yeah, and clouds. Spread across the whole sky, amazingly exactly. somehow. So what is the whole point of this? Well, I want to I wanted to bring that up because. That's part of a very important program. And, and it's amazing. I, it seems so obvious to me. I, I studied meteorology and I look, look at clouds in my life. It seems so obvious to me, but it's not to a lot of people because of the clever manipulation around the turn contrail and how people are confused and it's been going on so long that now it's just, they're just planes. And, but they're not just planes. Um, so why are they doing that? We need to understand that our climate is in serious flux. I mean, you saw we had record um, typhoons and earth and, and, and hurricanes over the last um, over this past uh, period that were just unprecedented. Puerto Rico has had over five thousand people died as a result of Hurricane Maria, devastating the island, and it got very little help. And most of those people died because they didn't have any food, water or any of these basic things. It was, it's like total anarchy in some of these places that have been hit by yeah, these storms. It's still, it's like just terrible out there. So, and this is not, this, we got, we can't pretend that this is just normal, that these, these devastating storms are occurring with uh, all over the world. Like you were just saying, it's all correlated. So the reason that this program, it's a geoengineering program. And if anybody wants to look it up, look up, uh, the FBI, John Brenner, he talks all about what SAIs are. He's like the whole, he has a whole press conference where he talks about it. 
and and this the, the point that it's a it's a relatively inexpensive global program that they're using to try to cool the planet. Simple as that. It's really not that complicated. SAIs that it just means that they're spraying these aerosol heavy heavy metals that are highly reflective, like aluminum, into the upper atmosphere as a means to simply um, reflect the incoming solar radiation back out into space. That's one of the major contributors, uh, the reasons they're doing it. And it's also part of a weather manipulation aspect too. Because they're concerned that with all these changes, both internally in the earth, as well as with our climate, that you're going to have even far more um, drastic consequences coming up in the near future. As in, I mean, just imagine if we were, the, the earth only has a certain set amount of water, okay? And I'm sure a lot of people know this. During the last ice age, only, you know, only 10 to 12,000 years ago, there was one to two miles of ice above my head. And then when all that ice melted in a, in, a, in a series of cataclysms, which is why a lot of these ancient civilizations disappeared, the ocean levels rose 400 feet, okay? Because all that water was locked up in ice. Now today, we don't have nearly as much as ice as we had back then, but we still have a pretty significant amount, especially if you look at places like Antarctica and you look at places like Greenland. Greenland. And if you consider the fact that the majority or a large part of, of, of the world's population lives almost at sea level, right along the coast, if you even just got uh, you know, a five foot, 10 foot fluctuation in ocean levels, you could completely devastate so many of these coastal areas and really cause havoc for a lot of places. I mean, look at Bangladesh. Places like that just had severe flooding from monsoons. What if they had ocean levels rise at the same time? You could see places like that completely get wiped off the map. And there are millions of people there. So we have to, we have to look at this and say, what is two questions we have to ask. Number one, what is causing this? And number two, is it going to get worse? And what is it leading to? And so to answer the second question first, I don't think anyone knows exactly what this is going to lead to because it's never happened during anyone's lifetimes. And I think we have a lot of speculation and we're going to talk about how, what might happen if something like the pole shift shifted, which it may already be doing. But we, can, we just need to be knowledgeable and prepared. And I think that the only thing people can do is to monitor things that are going on and if they need to take action then take action it wouldn't be stupid to have a small little med kit and some in some supplies of water and some various things in your car if you did need to go somewhere you know i'm not talking about building some bunker in the side of a mountains you know but <laughs> at, least, at least be semi-prepared um in case something does happen because remember we're just we're just organisms that are on the surface of the planet and we're at the whim of whatever this climate decides to do because earth is angry it's going through great changes right chris right well just since the time i've been paying attention to this stuff uh which is about three years now things have increased exponentially i mean uh i would you know in the beginning i had my uh my facebook page and i just report things every once in a while every couple of days now it's every day there's so many things happening all around the world that things are really kicking up and, and I would definitely be prepared for something, you know, um, you know, have at least a little extra water and food on the side. Cause we, like you said, we don't know how far things will go with this. Exactly. Exactly. And so we just need to be knowledgeable and prepared and, and understand there's a lot of great changes that are going on. Now let's talk about why some of those changes are going on. And this is what you would consider that term, the rabbit hole, because it really does go a long way. It's not just a simplistic thing. And the first thing I want to bring up is some people may have noticed in the news, they had these really, they've had these um, articles where um, scientists were baffled at solar output. They, you know, according to all the computer models and everything that they've followed, that we were supposed to be in, in a solar minimum. And yet we had, we had activity that was like a solar maximum. Now, I do think that we're, we're, lead, we're going into a solar minimum, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. In fact, before you go into a solar minimum, you would likely have very um, intense solar radiation in preceding it because that's usually how uh, events go. You would get an intense ending and then you would flip and then you would go in the, the other direction. And I think that's what's going on right now. Um, that's one of the reasons they're so concerned as part of the, the, the climate mm -hmm. aspect is that we're getting 
unprecedented warming all across the earth. I can't, you can't not agree with that. I mean, there's some really fundamentally well done studies that are not um, as biased. If you look at what's going on in Alaska in the, in, the, in, in the North Pole area, that is absolutely true. There is less ice than there's, than there's ever been up there. Um, and there, and, and they, of course, that leads into what we're going to talk about, which is the Inuit, because they are um, some of the best experts that we have for who, who commonly utilize understanding exactly where star alignments and, and things are. So let's, let's start by, um, I'm going to share some slides and we're going to go through so we can have some visuals while we talk about this. Okay, Chris? Yes, and you mentioned the Inuit. For, for those who may not know, can you just uh, tell us briefly who the Inuit are? <clears throat> okay, and yeah, we're, and we're going we're gonna to go into that. Um, the Inuit are a native people um, who, who live up in northern Canada, and they are still one of these groups that is largely separated from technology. They have some, it's being more and more an in influence to them, but there's a lot of um, parts of northern Canada up near Hudson Bay, up near um, uh, n north of Alaska, uh, all the way through through that area where you have um, populations of native people who have been there for generations and generations who hunt using the using the stars and the and the and the and knowing where the sun is and all these different things. And a couple of years ago, there's and, and this is like go go look this up because it's really really fascinating. There's some really great interviews where some of these Inuit leaders have come forward and they've sat down and they've, t they've talked about this because they're really concerned. They're alarmed. And what they're alarmed with is over the last couple of years when they've been hunting and they've, they've been following these stars to know where North is and, and how to, and how to, um, and how to follow game and all these things. They've seen these really drastic situations where the alignments are not where they used to be. And, and they are concerned that the earth's wobble we, the earth has wobbled and, and it's the magnetic poles have shifted to where the stars are no longer where they used to be before. And that is indicative of the beginnings of what could be a permanent pole shift. And that's, that should be very concerning to a lot of people because a pole shift. And of course it depends on the degree of the pole shift. That's another thing we don't understand. We have to understand is that the poles may have already shifted, but it has to do with the degree of how far they shift and how it impacts the planet. Because pole shifts, if they are in a serious, um, situ a serious degree, can cause cataclysmic problems on the Earth. Um, so, so the Inuit are really concerned that, that and, they're, and they're very convinced based on, on, on the correlation with a lot of different groups. It's not just one group of Inuit. It's many, many, many groups that have all come together and are, are all in agreement that there's, that there's, there's strange anomalies with, with, with these constellations, okay, and these, and these stars that, where they used to be. And so they're, they're very concerned with what's going on. And so what is going on? Indeed. Well, it has to do with specific, like I said, the, the sun has, has, is definitely a factor. But the, but the other factor that's, that I think is the biggest one has to do with what is in the outer part of our solar system. What exists and what is found right now just outside of our Kuiper belt. Now, um, I've talked about this in a couple shows. I, I apologize if it's a little bit of a repeat information, but it's extremely important because it represents one of the only glimpses we have to actually know what is going on out there. Because many, many people know that NASA does not tell everybody the truth. You know, never a straight answer is not always clear with what is existing out there and what is not. And so, when, so what you have to do is you have to read between the lines. You have to look at both what they've said and what they've not said, and also whatever evidence exists that, that shows that there's something out there. Now, th what I'm showing on the screen right now, on the, on the left side, this is from um, the 1987 New Illustrated Science and Invention Encyclopedia, Volume 18. And it's, it's just truly amazing because on page 2,488, it basically Matt, you were breaking up. Can you say that? You, you were breaking up, Matt. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Let me let me repeat that. So this yeah, just say the name again. Okay, yeah. This image is from the 1987 New Illustrated Science and Invention and Invention Encyclopedia, Volume 18. Perfect. Okay? 
So if you go on Google and you, and you type that exact thing in, you'll find this and you'll find the original article and what they state. Now, why this is important is because it represents some of the only data we have for what the pioneer probes found. You may, you may not know what the pioneer probes are, but in 1972 and then in 1973, NASA sent out two probes, um, P pioneer probe 10 and pioneer probe 11, because they, they wanted to find out what was causing um, disruptions to our outer solar system? Because because the, they knew there's been there's been a long there's been extensive um, study that's been done for a long time about why there's these strange protrusions to Pluto and Uranus and Neptune and, and it, actually in our entire solar system itself something is tilting the entire solar system and it's and it's significantly impacting the gravitational orbits of our outer planets. Okay. And, and so when you, when you, when you, well, we're going to talk about these, these pioneer probes, but what the, the article basically states, the amazing thing about the encyclopedia is they don't actually say anything about it. And I think that's, that's on purpose. It, it's more so it was, a, it slipped in here and there's nowhere else you can find this. This is the only place I've ever seen that actually gives this information because is some people may not like the idea of conspiracies, but they're very true. The idea that's, that there would be information held back and there'd be manipulation for this. It, it's, it's absolutely true. It's, you cannot deny it if you actually look at the facts. And so what this article actually, all it stated at the bottom was, it said, Pioneer 10 became the first craft to pass into inter interstellar space in 1983. The diagram shows the path of the two Pioneer probes. And they don't, they don't even mention what they found which is phenomenally interesting and very telling in my opinion. So the yeah. picture on the bottom left shows exactly what they found. And it shows this binary star that we've long since forgotten that exists far out beyond our sun. That's a dead star, which means it's much, much older than, than our sun, okay? Maybe even an, an invader from long ago. And then it shows, lo and behold, that a 10th planet, which we would now call planet nine because of the demotion of Pluto. But right. It shows it at 4.7, and this is very critical and important to understand. This is 1983. So this is where planet nine was in 1983. And it was 4.7 billion miles away, okay? Now, this, this gives you a diagram showing where these Pioneer probes went, okay? So Pioneer probe 11 went off, um, you know, out past Pluto and Neptune and it went a completely different direction and it didn't find anything. But yeah. Pioneer 10, of course, it went directly towards um, this, this area that where these, where these are, this planet and, the, and this binary sun are found. And they, and they got all these, um, this important uh, information back, this, these calculations back. And you would think that with some kind of a discovery like this, it would be all over the news. It'd be everywhere. And there was actually some stuff that was released back in the 90s, but there was then a lot of silence that was then preceded by that. Um, and I want to talk about how this, how this leads into all, uh, what is going on with these earth changes, because I want to bring up someone who's, who most people never heard of. There's a man named, um, the, the, the whole point of the, how this got started was there's a man named Thomas Van Flander, okay? And he's an American astronomer and scientist. And, and the quote that he gave, and he's, now he's deceased, just like all these strange deaths that always occur like this, but he yeah. gave this profound quote that really, really speaks to this, and it also speaks a lot to um, my work and the perceptions of, of how we've been given reality, okay? Like in, in my, my previous book, The Illusion of Us, it's this illusion of, of what reality of what we've been given, but it's really not exactly like that way. And the quote that he gives, very quickly, he says, events in my life, caused me to start questioning my goals and the correctness of everything I had learned. In matters of religion, medicine, biology, physics, and other fields, I came to discover that reality differed seriously from what I've been told, okay? And, and that's, that's exactly everything that I've seen would correlate to what, what he says. So Thomas Van Flander, this scientist, astronomer, he starts seeing this data for why is Uranus and Neptune being tilted and why is Pluto way out um, near the, in the Kuiper belt, okay? 
and he was very curious by a lot of these questions and he was studying some of these ancient, these ancient texts too. And he, based on what he was seeing, he was really, really confident and he, and he contacted Robert Harrington. And that's a name that, again, these are, these names are very important that we, we, we remember because they're like these unsung heroes that very few talk about and they deserve a lot of credit because they're the pioneers behind this. It's like the pioneer probe. And so yeah. um, Thomas Van Flander, he happened to be friends with Robert Harrington, which is a, a, was a high profile figure at the time, who's now also deceased as well. But he was um, the head astronomer at the US, um, the US, the United States Naval Observatory, okay? Right. So Flander comes to him and he shows him all this data. And at first Harrington, wasn't really that interested until he started to show him the actual data behind it because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of misconceptions and there's things that have been holding this information back like it's not real and all these things that have that have happened. But when you start seeing the dates of some of these discoveries we've made, for instance, the Kuiper Belt, which I'm showing on the bottom left, this enormous asteroid field that exists that's far larger than our inner asteroid field that exists between Mars and um, and Jupiter this massive Kuiper belt that exists around essentially our solar system. It was only discovered in 1992. That's think about that. Yeah. We're talking about information that's not really that old. So what we're going over, a lot of this was discovered in the nineties and then, and then buried. And now we're just coming back to it now as, as more and more of this is becoming more is, is becoming more open with, with the internet and disclosure like this. So, um, so, so Robert Harrington becomes really interested in this and he starts taking a look at it. Okay. And he takes what Flannard had done and he starts looking at the pioneer probe data and he becomes convinced he's convinced he knows, he knows that it's out there based on the signatures of what it's, of what it's creating. If you have, if you ha think, think about this, if you have our solar system being tilted by some kind of gravitational force and yes, gravity is real. If you have something that's tilting our entire solar system, and especially if you see the outer planets being more and more affected by it, that gives you a lot more evidence than some may realize because it proves that not only there's an object out there that's, that's causing that, but, it, but based on how much it's causing it, it gives you an idea how, how large it is. So you can determine a lot of things based on using some of the scientific data, even if you've never even seen the object itself. And that's how some of this works. Um, and, and that's why in 1992, um, NASA gave a press release that almost nobody knows about because it, again, it was one of these things that got buried, but NASA had this big press release where they, they came out and they said, just like I said, and remember this quote, because it actually ended up being extremely accurate even today. And I think it was accurate. It said, it says unexplained deviations and the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the sun. Okay. And if you remember, if we go back, when we, we, have, we have correlations to see and confirm some of the data for where these objects were. Okay. Right. Now, Robert Harrington, um, he sees all this. He looks at the iris data from 1993, which showed some kind of an object out there with what, made it, what might have been this illumin illuminated you know, uh, debris field on it and all these, these really strange things. So he travels to New Zealand because he knows that based on just how massively large the universe is in, 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 our, in our perspective looking out may seem small, but we can only see a, a very, very tiny fraction of what, we're, of, of what actually exists out there. So he knew that the only way to see this object based on his mathematical calculations was to go to New Zealand at the very southern edge, which was called Birch Point. And, and it, he went there and he, in 1993, he, he saw this object. Okay. It's in his, he talks about it. It's in a lot of the, the, the re readings that he, that he put together on this. And he, um, he discovers this thing with an eight inch telescope. Okay. And then he, and then before he's able to put all the scientific papers together, he mysterically, mysterically dies of throat cancer. All right. And Thomas Flandern also died too. Oops. Yeah. So there, so these two men who are very, very instrumental and important towards this information and bringing it mainstream are now gone. And what happened right when they both died, 
it was decisions made by NASA to hide and bury this. And they did. They buried it. You didn't hear anything about it for years. Okay. Um, all the way until 19, or, and all the way until 2012. Okay. We're talking about pretty recent stuff. It, right. Because in 2012, they started studying, uh, they started st studying the Kuiper belt. Okay. And they were studying these objects in the Kuiper belt, like comets and asteroids and all these different things. And they were, they were seeing the, all this data showing that even objects that are part of the Kuiper belt are being thrown in all kinds of strange ways, you know, out both out of, out of the Kuiper belt and into our inner solar system. Look right now, what you've seen in the last six months to a year, there have been more meteorite sightings than I've ever seen before. It's almost like there's one every week somewhere of some object shooting across the sky, illuminating everything. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, and you look at all the earth changes and all these things and you start to say, is it a correlation? Is something disrupting the Kuiper belt? Okay. Um, to give you a little information, the Kuiper belt is 200 times, maybe, maybe larger than, than the solar, than the, um, the asteroid belt that exists between Mars and Jupiter. Okay. This we're talking about something that contains thousands of asteroids and comets. Okay. And it's probably the main factor for why we've had extinctions on our planet for millions of years. This may be why we've seen extinction after extinction after extinction, then rebound and extinction. Because if you had a, protrude, a, a protruding object that, that, that's coming into the Kuiper belt and is disrupting all kinds of comets and asteroids that are then thrown into our inner solar system on a consistent basis, and we're going to talk about what that consistent basis is. Um, that's why you would see this, you would see these, um, these continuous cycles of say every 10, maybe 20,000 years where you would, you would have this, these events just that keep happening. And the reason I say that is because both Harrington and a lot of others that have come along have been studying this planet nine object that exists just that, that exists outside the cover belt. Okay. And they've determined that it has an orbit of somewhere. I know this is a big number, but it's somewhere between 10 and 20,000 years. Now, if you are a follower of Nibiru and a lot of those terms in the Sumerian stuff with Zechariah Sitchin, mm -hmm. I want to just say right away, he got a lot of his work right. Okay, He absolutely did. But I do not believe he got the term Nibiru right and the, 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 th the 3,600 year the orbit, orbit. Okay. Right. okay, and that, I think that was a mistranslation that had had to do with separate um, important events and cycles. But I, but so this object, instead of having a three thousand six hundred year orbit that goes right through between Mars and Jupiter, which would cause like chaotic, total chaos every three thousand six hundred years, yeah. it's more like a ten to twenty thousand year orbit of an object that still exists out there. So it's not like everything he said was. That all about, about this planet object was wrong. It's just some details were wrong. There still is this extra planet that exists out or outside our solar system, which is the main reason why we have all these impacts and all these things that have occurred in the past. Okay. Now it just means it has a, a, a different orbit that in it than we've, than we've been made to believe or some of the information we've been given. And that makes so much sense. If you look at when was the last time this happened on earth? You, you look, look at the geologic records, look at something like, well, we had an ice age 10 to 12, 10 to 12,000 years ago. If this, if this has an orbit of every 10,000 years, then it would correlate exactly with, with the ending, with the last ice age and the fact that these events are starting to happen again right now. Okay. Now, if, if looking at the last ice age, we, we saw a massive amount of ice that melted in a very short time, along with huge earthquakes and tsunamis and all of these things as part of multi-tier events that occurred. And I don't think we're going to see, I, I know we're not going to see anything on the level that, ex, that happened back then. Uh, the reason I know that is because, number, remember, the, the biggest factor was that they were in a, a huge ice age at that point. You know, the entire northern hemisphere had miles of ice, you know, a significant amount of the water of the ocean. Remember, 400 sea levels were 400 feet le lower than they are today. All of that water was in ice. 
and all that ice melted and, and all those other changes they caused complete havoc. And that's why the, um, the, the pre pre diluvian civilizations of Sumer and places like Atlantis and even the, even the origins of the pyramids, they likely are all from before those disasters occurred. And that's why we see this amnesia of all this information and how civil and how future civilizations had to then start up again from, from nowhere. Right. Which nowhere is simply just handing them, you know, from above again, but we can, we can go into that in a little bit, but I want to talk about getting back to where I was. Cause I jumped off a little bit there in 2012, there was, um, there's a Brazilian astronomer, okay, um, named Rodney Gomes, and he starts studying these, these objects in the Kuiper Belt, and he notices that they are all being perturbed by something. And the more he started to use his calculations, the more he started to determine that whatever this, this object was, it correlated with this four to eight times the Earth mass is, and it must be approaching the Kuiper Belt. Because why else would all these objects be, be acting that way? So where does this object go, Planet Nine? Well, it either passes into our, just, uh, just into our in, inner but most outer part of our solar system, you know, past, be, past Neptune. Or it just goes through the Kuiper Belt and then goes back out. I don't think we really know exactly where, where it passes through, and that pass may slightly differ. And that may be why we see sometimes different um, impacts from yeah, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is yeah. how close do you think this body or bodies would get to our planet I don't think it ever gets I don't think it ever gets past uh, Neptune and Uranus um, right. but that doesn't matter because it's again it's four to eight earth masses this is a significantly large planet and mm -hmm. that's why even even when it's far out you know millions of miles out it's still disrupting, it's still having a gravitational disruption on our entire solar system. And that only increases as it gets closer. It's the reason why Pluto is where it is. It's the reason why all of these strange anomalies are existing the way it is. And it may be the reason why we've seen, one of the reasons why we've seen such, so many cataclysms in, in our prehistory with, with, there's always a reason for, for things. So why is there an asteroid belt? Between, between Mars and Jupiter? Well, there was likely a planet that used to exist there that no longer is. It was blown up. I absolutely believe that, that was true. I don't, I don't think that that was from um, this planet coming through, but I think it was related. And I think, I think all of this stuff is related. We just have to see exactly how it's related and, and dig into both what the ancients said, looking at ice cores and climatology, climatology and also looking at the data from these um these probes and all these things so this object we call it planet x or planet nine it's approaching the kuiper belt right now that's why we're having so many of these these effects now as it approaches our the kuiper belt it it creates um, a gravitational disruption to all the other planets as well. And they start pulling and pushing. And that's why you're seeing so many magma cha changes in the earth with these tectonic and volcanoes is the earth is trying to find, is trying to balance the energy. It's like if you, um, if you have all this built up anger, you need to, you need to have, express it and have an outlet somehow. That's all. That's what the earth is doing. It's trying to take all these changes and to try to uh, manage the energy, you know, by setting off earthquakes with built up pressure and sending uh, and having volcanoes erupt with all the built up pressure. It's simply this, this, this Gaia planet that's trying to, 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 to mitigate whatever all these effects are. And we don't actually, we don't really know how far this pole shift is going to go because there's a lot of really strange um, secrets that have gone on in places like Antarctica and in the North pole where they may even, maybe even using technology to somehow prevent this from happening. And this, this uh, wobble of our, of these poles, it, it may be part of counteracting what, what's naturally starting to happen because beyond anything, they, I think that there's a lot of concern about what's going on. I think that's why you see so many black budget funds that have been, that have happened over the last many years with these strange um, government underground areas that they built and all this money that's disappeared 
And I, th I think that it's related to the fact that they just simply knew that all this stuff was coming down the road and they're preparing for it. And at the same time, they're trying to prevent whatever they can. Not that they're wonderful and all loving and helpful, because if you consider what, what SAIs are, these stratospheric aerosol injections to try to help cool the climate, we're, we're talking about a neurotoxin, okay? Al aluminum, aerosol, and these other heavy metals, they fall back down and we breathe them in. They're causing all kinds of problems with neurological problems and, and breathing problems. And, and, and we don't even know the extent of a, what a lot of these things are doing because it's simply a, a cheap means of doing this um, without having to spend a ridiculous amount of money because truthfully, there are other elements that could be used that would not cause health problems that would be even, even more effective. We're going to talk about those in a little bit. Um, but obviously, they're not using them. So we need to look at all these events and understand that they're correlated and, and that as planet nine is, uh, is approaching our Kuiper, Kuiper, the Kuiper belt, it's causing this, this, this push and pull back and forth with our entire solar system. All these gravitational disruptions, our entire earth is just this, um, it's basically like this perfectly see us, um, balanced magnet. Okay. You have these magnetic poles and it's got, energy that's the, with ley lines all over the earth. It's part of, it has, that's why Tesla was able to tap into, um, to this free energy of using the, the natural magnetic energy of the earth. That's all real. And so those magnetic poles, those get disrupted and that's why you get pole shifts. And that's what's happening. You're getting these, you're getting these shifts and these disruptions and this pull and pull and push and friction from all this. And that's what's, I think that's what's happening at the same time. You're getting, these solar maximums leading into a solar minimum. It's just, it's causing havoc right now in our climate and our, in our planet. So that's what I think is going on. And uh, so we're going to, we're going to move on now to, to the next area, Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did so, you have? Yeah, um, I, I mean, move on? It, there's, there's definitely so much going on and NASA, I believe right now is kind of dripping little bits of information about what's going on right now. You know, I think, you know, mentioning more about planet nine Yeah. and, um, you know, Definitely speaking of out. things that NASA is not telling us, um, it would seem that even from the, be our beginnings that there has been some sort of outside influence or manipulation or even control. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, it's gone, it's gone on a lot longer than we understand. And I think we need to get past the idea of us just being alone, us being here as a Darwinian ape. That's all alone. Everything is just us. You know, all these problems we're experiencing are simply our primitive nature that we're, that we're getting over and we're learning. I really don't, all my research has showed me that that's, that's not the case. There's, there's a lot more going on than just that. Um, and and one, of those, one of those things that, that is, is related to that is the idea of, are we alone? Uh, is, there, is there a higher, um, is there this control side of our um, higher government that is controlling all this information? holding it back from people and, and what are they, what are they part of? Why are they hiding all this stuff? Why is there so much information that people, people are not allowed to know? And that's where you get into like, like your, the, the title of your channel. It really is forbidden knowledge. It's knowledge that it's, just, it's been determined that based on these powerful monotheistic religions, Christianity and this one powerful God who, to, to be clear, I abso absolutely believe looking at everything, all the spirals in nature and all of the perfect Fibonacci numbers and sequences, there's absolutely like a prime creator that created everything. Absolutely. But that has nothing to do with this God that's in these monotheistic religions, okay? There has been certain controllers in our past that have played the role of gods to us, and they're not God at all. And that's what I want to talk about because we have this perception that's been given to us again, that we're all alone and that there's nothing, there's nothing else out there. And yet at the same time, if we look at the, the data that is presented and you just look out in somewhere like the Hubble telescope, there are millions of galaxies that exist beyond our Milky way. Okay. Millions of galaxies. And when, within each galaxy, 
there are billions of planets and stars. One of the, and one of the really interesting aspects that I still find amazing, I bring it up all the time, but I can't get over it, is that these little things that, that alter the perception of how we view reality. Like if you go up to any, almost anyone I ask, when I go up to them, usually at nighttime, because that's where it comes up, I say, when you look up there and you see all those, sun, all those stars, what do you think those stars, those, those, they, they say, well, what do you think those stars are? And people are like, I don't know. Honestly, that's the most common answer I get. I guess I didn't really think about it. I, 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 so I tell them, I say, well, what is a, what is a star? Because it's funny, we have these terms, right, that have been put into our, that have been put into our collective where they describe something, but they don't describe what it really is. It's almost a way to describe it as a way where we don't really think about the real logical way that, 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 that really, um, the, the definition of what it is. So instead of saying stars, why don't we just say suns? Isn't that strange? We say stars and it, and it seems like nothing to people because a lot of, some people do know, oh yes, suns and stars, but most of society, somehow thinks that stars are some bright object in the, that's out there that I don't really know what they think it is. It's weird. Maybe they just don't really think about it because, because then I say to them, okay, well, those are suns. And they say, really? Oh my God, those are all suns? I say, yeah. And you know that all of those suns likely have planets that are all revolving around them. And then they just like stare at me totally, you know, with this look on their eyes because they, a lot of people don't think about that because if they do think about that, they'll start to have this total humble amazement of everything that exists around us. And you almost seem stupid if when you look at it with that perspective and you think that everything is just alone, there's no life anywhere. You know, billions of, of planets and millions of galaxies with all these suns and all of this, all these planets moving around them with some planets that are right in that Goldilocks zone where they have just enough energy and they're, and you know, they're not too hot, not too cold. And yet they're all empty, right? They're all just sitting there with barren, no sure. life, but that's not real. That's really not how it is. In fact, it's probably the complete opposite. Just based on, if you look at, well, look at um, how common the elements are. We are carbon based life forms. Okay. If you do, um, if, if, when you look out and, and, and we study a lot of these other planets and solar systems and, and, and places, we can see that they have, um, an extensive amount of, you know, carbon present and, and nitrogen, all these, pla all these things, they're the exact ingredients that are necessary for life being there. Not that it developed there, but being there. And that's what I want to talk about because I do think that life developing out of nowhere is much more rare than we've been told. Not that it doesn't happen, because obviously something had to come from somewhere. But I think that it's much, like the whole idea of the primordial pool and things moving through because of lightning and then changing, you know, something in the ocean crawls on a land and then it becomes, eventually becomes like a person. I really don't think that that's how we need to view um, the progression of how this goes. Um, right. I think that that happens on very, very rare occasions in extremely optimal conditions. And Earth was not one of them. If you look at Earth, we've had billions of years of of situations where the um, volcanoes and tectonic um, situations would essentially wipe all life off the planet. It wouldn't have been possible because it wouldn't have had a chance to to reestablish itself over what I think needs to be millions and millions of years for something like that to to progress and happen. So the more likely thing that I, that I, I really believe is that a lot of planets that are determined to be perfect for life are then either given life through things like panspermia, you know, objects crashing into them that have life from somewhere else, or they're literally planned out and, and life is brought to them from some sentient ancient civilization that, that is working towards um, the balance of, 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 of creating an, a perfect um, ecosystem there that is in the harmony of nature, not, you know, just going to a place and just throwing a bunch of random life there. It has nothing to do with that. I think these, we're talking about if a sentient civilization was able to reach a higher point, they would have to have some kind of a conscious mindset 
in most cases, or they would essentially destroy themselves with war. Now, we're going to go over a couple examples of where that may not be exactly the case. But in, in, in largely the case may be that if look at look at Earth. We take it so for granted, the life that's on this earth. There are millions of species, millions all over the planet. When you start to look at it, it's almost baffling. I mean, in some, in some areas of like Ecuador and Peru, there are thousands of species of just insects, and, and let alone everything else that exists. When you start to get down to it, it starts to, um, it starts to look more like a DNA library than being just some random occurrence where life was able to take every possible shape and, and perfectly um, exist in its own ecosystem and environment. I think the more likely situation is that things were naturally put there that would, that would do well. And the things that didn't disappeared and things that did well continued. And they, and, they, and they likely did adjust to their environment as some areas became colder or hotter. I absolutely believe that more hair could be grown or whatever, but I don't think that you can have something like um, a fish that turns into um, an advanced humanoid. I don't. I, or if it happens, it's so rare that it it, it may be been the source of some of, the, of some of what we're about to talk about with some of these ancient ancient beings that have been alive millions of years. Because you always have to ask, you know, was you know the what, what was first, the chicken or the egg? So it always comes back to well, something has to come from somewhere. And so, and that, and so we'll, we'll talk about that, but so there are, there are so many, there are so many galaxies and planets. Okay. And this is what I want us to wrap our minds around that they would outnumber every grain of sand, grain, grain of sand on all the beaches of earth. Just put that into perspective and then try to come back and say that it's all empty and there's nothing out there. It, it, it's, it's silly. So yeah. look at something like the Drake equation and Drake was um he was he was brilliant he and he realized just like we're talking about if you look at all of the things like the the amount of carbon that exists and nitrogen and all the things that exist out there in the universe and and the proximity of suns with planets that are going to have the perfect amount of life and then you factor in species that develop that then become wiped out due to due to disasters and you and, and you factor all that stuff in even with um, the chances that most civilizations destroy themselves with that really pessimistic, pessimistic viewpoint, you still come up with like thousands of advanced civilizations across even our galaxy alone. And that's looking at in a pessimistic way. I don't know that there's that many, but I do know that there's a lot of life that exists out there. And there's absolutely advanced civilizations that exist, exist at the same time. Um, and I think that largely because of how we've been structured around um, these monotheistic religions around how there's this God figure who created humans here and that there's nothing else out there. It's this really, really closed minded viewpoint, um, not an expansive viewpoint at all. Would you agree with that, Chris? I would definitely agree. And I, I've always been fascinated with the fact that, I mean, I could never see, like you said, how a fish could just turn into a human being. Um, you know, it, it may be over millions and millions of years, but I mean, just not, uh, it doesn't seem feasible. And, you know, the fact of off world, um, sort of maybe manipulation or engineering. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a second. That's, that's, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, yeah, go, go ahead and continue. So instead of, so you have these two situations that I see existing, you have situations where these very, very benev benevolent, you could call them angelic races, maybe something like the Pleiadians, okay? They may, may go around and do, and do the, and almost do the work of what you would consider the prime creator with helping spread life in balance in these ecosystems and all these things, where, whereas what it, you could have, you could have advanced beings who reach the point where they wanted to become gods to other civilizations at the same time. And I think that is what this power play and this, and this idea of this struggle of darkness and light, it's not just metaphorical. It's, it's real. It, I think it is a very real thing where there are, you, you either have beings that, you know, they live so long that they either decide to become beings that are follow this, this path of light or a path that is more like a path of darkness. Now, and let's, let's talk about who they are because right now, if you look at, um, 
a lot of the the mainstream places like Joe Rogan and a lot of these places, they are really, really hammering and attacking the idea of anything that is connected to ancient aliens or anything that's connected to these civilizations. But, but one of the things that's really, um, I think that is a misconception that we have to get past is that these beings are like, you know, little, little green men that show up in some spaceship and then they just come down, they take over a planet. I think we need to completely get past that idea. We need, to, we need to strongly look at the sheer distances that exist in space, okay, between places. And I, I'm going to give you an example. Like, if you look at something like um, the Andromeda Galaxy, okay, the Andromeda Galaxy is two and a half million light years away, which means if you were to travel at the speed of light, which we can't even get close to doing, it would take two and a half million years to get there. Okay, so let's get past the idea of this whole, these, these advanced beings and craft traveling all over the place like that. I do not think that that's how it goes. Instead, think scientifically with something like advanced beings that are actually transdimensional, who, who advance so far that they are actually able to have the ability to exist in higher dimensions. And I think that's where the term heaven comes from in the Bible. Anywhere you see heaven in the Bible, just replace it with higher dimensions. And it'll make a lot of sense. Like in the Sumerian King List, which isn't the Bible, but any of these ancient writings that mention heaven. Like the Sumerians say that these beings that came down from heaven to earth came. The Sumerian King List says kingship was lowered from heaven. All over the Bible, it just mentions that beings came down from heaven. Heaven is just higher dimensions. Higher dimensional beings that come down to the realm of earth, the third dimension. And that's something we really got to, we got to talk about. And so um, these beings have been called many names. And I want to, I want to, I want to mention every name, not every name, but a lot of the names that they've been called in, um, in the Hebrew Bible, they're called the Elohim. Okay. And in the, the book of Enoch, they're called the watchers. And um, in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, they're called the Archons, okay? And then to the, to the Sumerians, they're called the Anunnaki. And they call themselves the Anuna. And that's a very important term that's, the term Anunnaki is so polluted right now that it's, it's ridiculous. So many people believe that Zechariah Sitchin created the Anunnaki. That's absolutely not true. You, people really need to start going to look at um, the Chaldea account of Genesis, written by George Smith, which is just the translations of the Adrahasis in the late 1800s. This is, we're talking about translations done far before he was even around. And they, and they extensively talk about the Anunnaki, extensively talk about Enlil, Enki, and all of these things that they did. And one of my favorite quotes that um, in the Adrahasis that I seriously, I, I can't get over. I, I feel like I think about it all the time. And I think it's, it's, one of the clues to all of this, Enlil says to Enki, okay, these, these gods, he says to him, where you went, you were to undo the chain to set us free and hold the balance. Okay, so what does that mean, setting us, setting us free? Well, if you look at who the watchers were in the book of Enoch, and you look at the Atrahasis talking about these Ajiji workers, I think that these, these, these advanced beings that are probably a mix, again, I think they're just a mixture of beings from all over that just call themselves that because they're part of a, a royal group. But I think they're, they're probably just mixed in people that are from the Palladians and whoever. They're just, just think of them as advanced beings that came to earth, the realm of earth, and whatever existed before they came, they completely dismantled and disrupted. What does that mean? Well, there was, there was likely some kind of a balance and grid that existed here before. There was life everywhere. There was a, essentially, earth was perfectly balanced. Everything was before they got here. And when they came here, they disrupted a lot of that balance, okay? And one of those ways that they disrupted it was, these, these Gigi, what they represent are basically soldiers or workers of these Anunnaki. And the term Anunnaki is strictly referring to these royal members, these beings of could call them the Royal Council of Twelve. They simply represent beings that are millions of years old, 
have that are not that are, have reached the point where they can essentially extend their lives and, and, and are eternal, and they have the ability to in, influence um, huge areas, not even just here. They may be influencing other places too and playing, and playing the gods. I mean, just try to wrap your head around that. What if the same thing that's happened here, which we're about to talk about in a minute, has happened on other planets too? And what if they're playing the, the role of gods to them as well? And I say that because there seems to be these gaps where they just disappear. And they, and they, are, they, they leave their, um, their controllers of the higher ends, ends of our um, kingship and society in control. And then they, they return after these, after these amounts of time. And so it's very interesting to me that there are these gaps where they're gone. I, I'll, and and I, think, I think it also has to do with the fact that they perceive time differently than we do too. So these EGG workers, they came, these Anunnaki and these EGG, they came to Earth. However means that was. They came here and they, they decided to take over our entire reality. I mean, everything. The term I mentioned, undo the chain to set us free. I think it represents the idea of no longer needing to have a physical third dimensional body here. Okay. That's why humans were created because these a GG, they were the ones on the planet who had to, they talk about, it's extensively talked about in the Atrahasis. They had to clear all the, the channels and lifelines of the land. And if you look at where, these civilizations were existing, they were in Mesopotamia. And that was never a super, um, it was never a lush area with lots of trees. They were essentially dependent on these rivers, river systems to provide ag agriculture means to, to, to grow food. That's, that's absolutely true. And if you don't clear these, these, these rivers that go through these arid areas, they fill up with silt and they clog and you can completely lose access to using these rivers. That's why they dredge and clear out rivers today because then you can keep them clear and flowing. They do it all the time to the Nile. Um, so that you provide yourself with the ability to have water. And that's what they were doing. These workers were doing all this manual labor on, on earth while these Anunnaki got, could simply reside, uh, you know, above them watching down while they did all the work. And eventually after 3,600 years, that's where that number really is. After that number, they revolted. They, they, they did not want to work on, in this planet any longer and do all this work. They begged and, and forced essentially the Anunnaki to then create, uh, to take um, the hominids that already existed on the planet, which there were, which were compatible with them. See, that's why would they need to be compatible? Because they need to incarnate and use us, have the ability to use us as hosts. That's what the term undoing the chain and setting us free is. Mm -hmm. They literally had the ability to create an entire reality here where they could Enki and, and th like thought they were kicked into these lower dimensions while Enlil and Ninurta and some of these other gods were, were um, ruling these upper dimensions. And together, because remember, as above, so below, there are higher dimensions and there are lower dimensions. So right now, you and I talking and everything we're perceive it, perceiving, this is simply just one aspect of what reality is. It represents just the third dimension. This is just the third dimension of where, um, of where you have actual physical matter that exists here. And in the new book that I'm writing, it's called The Stage of Time because it represents how Earth in the third dimension is this stage for both the upper dimensions and lower dimensions and how all of it's being played out here in the third dimension. Because if you're a higher dimensional being, how do you influence something that's going on in the third dimension if you're not actually physically there? You can't unless you either influence the, a being that's there, that's in the third dimension, or you incarnate right in and, and literally become like a human who's not really a human. And I think that's exactly what's going on. That's why they took these Denisovian Neanderthal hom early hominids simply because they were compatible. Because, again, these beings are, they are an ancient, hom um, they're an ancient homo hominid species. Okay. They're, they're, they're similar to us. We're, we're designed again in the Bible, God created us in their likeness, their likeness. We are created in these Anunnaki likeness. They're, they're not really God. They're playing the roles of God. So we're, we were created in the image of, like, of these Anunnaki gods, just much shorter and smaller. 
because we have to, we were designed to basically perfectly exist and thrive on this planet with a certain amount of gravity and all these factors that go into play with how big a species is. The larger a planet is, the larger you can have um, beings there. And, and our planet Earth is really not that big if you, if you look at other planets. And that's one of the reasons why we're not that big. Um, so these beings came here hundreds of thousands of years ago, and they literally disrupted and, and, and created their own reality here. They took over the lower dimensions, which were called the underworld, and they took over the higher dimensions, and they lowered kingship from heaven. Go read the Sumerian king list. King list. They lowered all the laws to these civilizations that just came out of nowhere, the Sumerians. They, they, even, they even talk a lot about that. They say agriculture, mathematics, writing, um, all of this knowledge was just handed down to them from above. And I think that's all, it, that's all it is. After the floods destroyed everything on earth almost, they had to then re-lower it again. And that's exactly what they say. They have these two points where they lowered it once. It was all, it was, a lot of it was destroyed and they had to re-lower it again. And that's where we are now. This jump start of developing civilizations that we're now just reaching the point where we're beginning to understand what we already knew 10,000, 12,000, 20,000 years ago. And, we're just, and, and part of the reason we're just getting back to that is that there has been a much different situation in place than there was back then where there's been a lot of control and, and, a, and a need to not let people know this because of who some of these gods were that were in, that were decided to be in control of of our time period these beings they completely run and the, the decisions on who rules what based on the zodiacal periods so we were coming through this period of pisces represented by the fish that's why we see the fish all over religion because that was the controller of the time of pisces and then now we're now we're moving into aquarius and pisces was considered the last several zodiac zodiacal house periods have had an extremely negative polarity. They've had constant war and suffering on this planet, and we're moving in. We're moving out of that time finally into this new time because there's been all these this conflict with these these higher dimensional transdimensional Anunnaki beings, with them being greatly divided. There's a great divide with them on some being appalled. Oops. Some being appalled with how we're being treated and what's going on and others essentially being the, being the controllers that are making the decisions and, and, and having this happen. So there's two sides and, and a great struggle going back and forth between the, between the two. That's um, exactly what uh, I was going to ask you about. I mean, you had mentioned the lower dimensional and the higher dimensional. So they obviously have different ideas for what they want out of humanity, you would say, right? Absolutely. Now, this may be kind of complicated for some. Now, the modern church has given this idea of Satan and the snake being evil and all of this stuff. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But yeah, and how um, the, the underworld and all these lower dimensions are all the evil beings, whereas mm -hmm. the ones in, in, the, in heaven, the higher dimensions are the angels and helping us in these in, the, in God. And everything. It's completely backwards. Flip that right around. Understand that a lot of these beings of benevolence and like Enki and, and Thoth, they were forced to control the lower dimensions in the underworld, whereas these other cruel beings like Enlil were essentially, because they were higher ranking and through, and through the decisions that were made, they were given ownership to rule over the higher dimensions. And that's why so many decisions have been made on this planet because of them because they have the biggest influence over us, okay? And that's where we're gonna start getting into talking about the eagle and the serpent in a second. But I wanna bring up these, the idea that these ancient cultures have mentioned beings that have been part of them is all over the place. I mean, look into, look into the Hopi. They, they called a lot of these beings that warned them and, discuss, and talked to them. They referenced both the Pleiadians and what they call the ant people who helped them during, during different disasters. Um, and of course the Mayans talk about their God Kuku Khan. And this is, and this is where I want to, I want to bring up as we get into, um, as we get into this, ne the next, the ne next aspect of this. Kuku Khan and Quetzalcoatl as part of the Aztecs and the Mayans. Okay. We're told that those were just, um, you know, ideas of these, 
of these. Wait, colors. you were breaking up. You said, um, can so you repeat at, the names at, um, of those beings again? Yeah. So Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl. Those are the gods that that the Mayans and the Aztec had. Okay, that 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 created them, and they talk about all over. And we're told that just like that example, any time in the world where these where where civilizations are mentioning gods, they're simply metaphors and they're not real. Yet, you have to think about the fact that these um, references to symbols that are used on both sides are found all over the earth. Okay. First of all, and second of all, if you take a situ go to a situation like in Mexico with Quetzalcoatl, okay, when Cortez invaded Mexico, okay, from from the Spanish, when he in when he landed, the Aztec were all confused because he had a a, a beard and he was a Caucasian and he he looked just like. Quetzalcoatl. So if you look at the if you look at the um, the, the Aztec teachings and a lot of the stuff they've, they've discussed, they say that Quetzalcoatl was a plumed serpent god. But but there's other places where they reference him as also being this long bearded old man. Okay, which is totally bizarre that they would say that if none of this was real. If yeah. all of it was simply just ideas that they had for representing seasons and storms and cycles and all those things, they would not be directly referencing the fact that these that these gods that they worshipped looked just like, um, you know, bearded Caucasian men. Furthermore, Aztec Mayan people and people from um, Mesoamerica they don't have facial hair. That's another thing that's really interesting about this. So there's, there's Quetzalcoatl, this bearded man. They, none of them have facial hair. How, did that, how is that possible that some bearded man was in Mexico? So basically what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say is there's all these very strange aspects that if you really start to look at it, you'll, you'll quickly realize that, that these gods all throughout history, regardless of what civilization they are, they're being represented by these Anunnaki beings in both higher and lower dimensions. And what those beings are doing is because of that great divide that exists between them, they're having, they're, you, could, you could say they're competing for how human civilization will go, okay? On the right side, I have um, an old Roman coin that shows an eagle eating, a, destroying a serpent, okay? And that is the main focus all over the world. It's this asp this idea behind that these that these gods had symbols and metaphors they used to, re to, re to reflect them and, and, and their family and, and, this, and those who were part of their, um, their certain mentality, okay? So Enlil, um, Ninurta, anyone that's associated with that side, there's many, many, many sons um, and daughters even that have come through that have used these symbols. Whenever you see a serp, uh, whenever you see an eagle, regardless if it's a double-headed eagle or a phoenix, there are all these variations of the same thing. And when you start to get down to it and you look at um, all over the world, you start to see, well, okay, so eagle, the eagle, the, the symbol of the eagle represents war and power. But why? And furthermore, if that was a random thing that just, that was just, let's say, adopted by early civilizations then how was that those how were those symbols able to travel all over the world by cultures that were completely disconnected who used the exact same symbols to, to reflect them it's impossible and so my the reason i haven't done a lot of youtube videos is that i'm extremely focused on finishing the new book that i just mentioned it's called the stage of time and one of the big focuses on it besides understanding reality and dimensions and in our origins is it really talks about who these beings are and, and, and how, how they've influenced our human civilizations for essentially thousands of years. And we've been influenced for so long that we actually think that those, that is essentially human nature. So when you look at um, empires all across the world, you say that's just human nature to want to be warlike and be empire-like. What about human cultures that are completely disconnected from outside influences? What about cultures in the Amazon? What, what about some of these places that never had out, outside influences? Are these cultures in the Amazon 
grouping together and getting all of their spears together and they're, and they're like conquering the entire Amazon and killing every other culture and then creating these massive empires of dominant. No, the complete opposite is happening. If that's human nature, then, then look at how these, these civilizations that are, have no outside influence that are, you know, they're largely unimportant in, in the, in the larger scheme of things and what we would consider to their, to these gods because they're not really having an impact. That's the most important thing. So these, civil, these, these civilizations in the Amazon, what are they doing? They're just living in balance with nature. They're farming. They're, they're not over excessively taking um, things out of the environment because they, they're in harmony with nature. And that's exactly what human nature would be if it was le left to its own, um, I guess, without outside influences. We are... Well, we're very passive. We don't really like to move forward with things. We like to just be peaceful and loving and, and have a, and, and some would argue, and I definitely agree with this, that if humans had been left alone, like we'd been genetically jumpstarted, right? And then given a bunch of stuff and then left alone, we probably would not have progressed as far as we have now. And that's a lot, that's pretty hard for people to understand, but it is true that when a species is stressed, especially a, street, a species that's passive like humans, it does force them to move to an, a higher place or fight to, um, to survive or get higher you know, knowledge. And sometimes stress can be an extremely effective means of progressing a species. And at other times, if you have too much stress, you can severely impact the ability for someone's consciousness to be able to go forward. Like if you are, if you have only war and only um, suppression of consciousness and really, really bad foods and things in the air that are poisonous and fluoride in our water and all these things, instead of stressing in a good way, you can cause people to become extremely healthy and, 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 um, divided and separated from wanting to seek a higher self because they're just in a, in a fight or flight situation. They're, they're in their lower state just trying to survive. And in that means, if you have a situation where people are, are just trying to survive in, in their lower red chakra of fear, then they're never going to be able to reach higher stages, states of consciousness, consciousness. So there's a delicate balance between pushing the species a little bit and overstressing it out and causing it to be essentially in like a, a war hell. Like we, a, we exist in now. It really is a war hell all over earth. That's essentially what's ruled our thousands of years of generations. It's just war, war after war after war with millions of people being slaughtered. And we all just think it's, it's completely natural, but it's not. And, and so that's where the, that's where the Eagle comes in. These war gods who, why are they doing this? Why would they do this, right? Why would they, if you are an advanced being, okay, and you, and the genetics of a, 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 a primitive hominid, if they, if your genetics of, of your divinity, you know, you think you're, you're literally the most powerful, some of the most powerful advanced beings that we, that we know of, maybe in the entire um, galaxy, maybe further, because the Anunnaki are extremely advanced and powerful. If you are in that mentality and you live forever and you, you have all this vast advancement that, that, we, that you know, that these Denisovian Neanderthals, that, that they're like primitive, almost like primitive apes. If you were to contrast that and, and then you were to find out that your gifts were given to something, to a species like that, you might feel a lot of resentment you, and you might, you might have some hatred towards, towards them just because like Enlil says, you know, his, and he's got many names, Yahweh in the, in the Bible. Like he says, humans are, humans to, to him are considered like beasts who never deserved these gifts that were given to us. Whereas on the other side, Ea, known as Enki and Thoth and all these other, these other beings, um, Ninma, they, they feel that we are, we're an essential aspect of the future. Meaning we are, a very important part of what is going to happen in the future of our, of our timeline. We have incredibly important potential that lies ahead of us. And that's where this whole thing comes in. You see so many TV shows, TV shows that are talking about how 
timelines are being fought over with people coming back at certain times to change things. And the whole point behind that is because there's a struggle over where our future goes, what our potential is going to be. Because there are many that know that because we have all these gifts and we've been designed as like essentially a perfect being by master geneticists, we have the potential to become creator gods, just like they are. Creator gods of our own reality that can ascend beyond the third dimension and become higher dimensional beings just like them. So what you could do then is you could then you could control that species because you're in higher dimensions above them and make them believe that you're gods. And then you could control them in many, many ways. And that's exactly what's happened. This competition over which direction we're going to go. Um, and so the serpent by the modern church and the dragon have been made to believe, we've been made to believe are evil when they're the symbols that have been referenced as, as Enki and, and Thoth and, um, and all, and all these benevolent sides that have been trying to assist us. And at the same time, and you can see that with the Garden of Eden story, you can see that with um, the fact that Druids were, were called snakes by St. Patrick and, and all over the world. The Gnostics um, were called snakes. Uh, Nag Hammadi scriptures, which are Gnostic, Gnostic writings, that simply translates Nag, snake writings. It's everywhere. It's the idea that there's a struggle, between, and it's not just metaphorical, that there's a struggle between human civilizations to either have enlightenment and higher consciousness or to have war and control using our demiurges. And, and I always have to bring it up because everyone always gets stuck on the idea, well, then why would cultures like the Aztec and Maya become warlike and have blood sacrifice if they were being influenced by these higher conscious beings? This is an area that in the new book I'm really talking about with some of the research I've done. If you look into the Aztec, go look up in, in, the, in the Mayans. Go look at some of these gods like God El. The Mayans have an extensive amount of gods that, 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 they, that they talk about, okay? Quetzalcoatl was just one god. He was the serpent, he was the plume serpent dragon god, okay? Just like Kukulkan was, the same, the same being. It was essentially Thoth, in, incarnating and in, in, in playing the, these certain roles. Now, they were not, they talk, Thoth talks so much about in, in, in these writings that he's against blood sacrifice. You can read it. It's not, it's so, it's obvious that these are, why would you teach a civilization about the stars and about balance with nature and then come back and then teach them that they should be killing each other for blood sacrifice and go to war? That doesn't make okay. sense. Yeah. These beings are not all playing dual roles. That's not how it is. What's more likely, look, in this, look into a being like Nergal, who was one of these sons of Enlil who went to the underworld. That means that some of these beings of the eagle, these warlike beings, instead of the underworld just being these higher dimension, these beings that are benevolent, like the, the serpent beings like we're talking about, some of these, uh, these warlike beings went into the, to the lower dimensions, these underworld beings, and almost pretended that they were someone else to completely corrupt. I mean, that happens all the time now, right? False flag event events are created to try to blame someone else to, to completely corrupt and make their, to, to falsely motivate so that, you know, someone will feel a certain way about someone else falsely. That's exactly what this was. It's always been this competition over pretending you're certain beings. And I do think that a lot of these incarnations like Amon, Ra, and all of these, they're being played by certain, these are certain Anunnaki beings who are just playing incarnation roles. That's it. Hermes is the same way, all of these. They're just incarnation roles of these higher dimensional beings to influence and affect how our world goes, okay? And I think I, I largely see that as being what is still going on today with the fact that why do we have a modern society with, um, that's largely been designed around democracies? And yet, in a place like England, there's still, we still have this kingship royal structure. That's so bizarre. Isn't that weird? Yes. Today to still have that because yeah. they are literally still the direct influence of these bloodlines of these kings and pharaohs that goes all the way back to these Anunnaki beings. They, remember, they have the ability to become physical. Okay, there's, that's how else would they have sons and daughters somewhere and then that would be the way it is. They do have the ability to become physical, but they also have the ability to be non-physical. 
And so they can essentially send their bloodlines, you know, develop their bloodlines on earth, like these fallen angels and Nephilim that are talked about. And then they could essentially take those bloodlines and make those the rulers of kings and queens and have that be a trickle down that stays only in the higher structure of our, you know, these Rothschilds and Illuminati, Illuminati families that have these bloodlines. That's not an accident. Why do you think the queen was so pissed that Megan was going to get married in this, in this marriage? Because she was outside these bloodlines. That's why they're so, they're so upset with all this stuff that's going on because it's disrupting this old model that's existed for a long time of protecting these bloodlines and controlling essentially everything. They're, they're the, the Vatican is, is who the direct controllers are with religion, where, where, while the, the Rothschild family are the direct financer controllers of our monetary system of the world. It's so obvious. The Rothschilds, they own the central banks, which who own the Federal Reserve, and they're all privately owned banks. And any of these countries that don't follow those rules, like Iraq and Syria and Iran, who are not part of the central bank, they get, get thrown into war turmoil. And that's not, only, that's not even the only reason why that's happening, of course. That's also the, 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 where the ancient civilizations were too. Um, so that's how I see our reality is that, like on the left, these beings, this is a, a symbolic metaphor. They weren't actually eagles. This is referencing this side of being these eagle gods, you know, passing knowledge sometimes to civilizations and then creating war. There were situations where some of these beings would, would pass knowledge and all these things. Like I think agriculture is, is actually mentioned as being given from Enlil. So they, they, they did provide um, things to civilizations, but, but why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to have a civilization in your name that you could control under, under your laws? You know what I mean? And that's, that's what I think a lot of these were. Um, and so I know I just went off on like a really big tangent on that. Oh, no, that's fascinating, though. So we're going to hopefully have a time for a lot of the other stuff we're going to talk about, too. Oh, yeah. but, so let me, let me move on, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. What were we going to say? Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, so, you know, it's fascinating that, um, you know, they could have had – and well, they, they probably still have this involvement and it would seem that they could have passed along a lot more knowledge to us. Maybe uh, some knowledge about space travel and, and uh, higher technologies. Um, can you like talk in the Emerald Tablets. That? What's that? If you read the Emerald Tablets, that's yeah. probably the closest you're going to get to what you just asked for. Talking okay. about, um, yeah, about energy, space, dimensions. That's basically what that, yeah, I really took. That's an amazing aspect. I really, people should really read the Emerald Tablets. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so I mentioned, we're going to talk about space now and about, about space travel, okay? And about why these unlucky beings came here in the first place. Okay. Um, it's not just to have host incarnate, incarnate into. There, there is definitely a physical aspect of this as well. And a lot of people, they roll your eyes when they start, you start talking about things like elements, like gold and all these things, because it's, it's difficult for our mindset to, to get past the materialistic side of what we've been given with a lot of these things. You know, people are all wearing gold necklaces and all of these things. And they're like, oh, they're so pretty and I love them. And, but they don't understand, a lot of people don't understand that some of these elements are the most important and rare elements that exist in the entire universe or in the, that we, that, we, that we know of. Gold, the atomic structure of gold is in such a way where it may be the most important of all elements, okay? Now, the earth happens to have a tremendous amount of gold. We can look at our solar system. We, we can actually see what planets, what, what terrestrial planets have, you know, metal bodies and, and, or what are gas giants and what are what, and which ones have what. But, and we've never seen, we've never seen anything around us we've never determined that there's even large amounts of gold any in any of the planets around us earth has a tremendous amount of gold because gold can only be created through a certain um, process of very 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 intense heat and geological changes that that take millions of years to create it's one of the hardest elements to create okay and when you like we were talking about these kings and pharaohs go look at the pharaohs a lot of these pharaohs have been dug up and they've had what are, what's called monoatomic gold powder or Orm's gold that's found below their, um, their sarcophagus. 
and it's just white powder. And you start looking into how some of them lived a long time. And we look at the Sumerian king list and a lot of these, a lot of these kings and these rulers lived an extremely long time. And it starts to really make sense that not only do they have some of this DNA that's from some of these gods, but they could have been using some of these elements, alchemy, to, to reach their highest states. And I think that's what the mindset we really need to, get, get, um, to come across. Don't think of it as coming here and just trying to get all these resources because they're worth money. If you look at um, the teachings of all these ancient civilizations, like the Gnostics and um, Egyptians, they all basically talk about how alchemy is the end goal. Alchemy is the means for which you learn how to manipulate the elements and the world around you, and it, it, it leads to everything. Alchemy is the end game, okay? So if alchemy is the end game, and alchemy is based on elements, then why is that so hard to believe that even if beings are transdimensional and, higher, and from higher dimensions, they would still have a need to have a physical body somewhere, and they would still need those means for technology, like... I mentioned the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million, um, million light years away. So instead of traveling in a straight line somewhere, if you were an advanced civilization, you would take a shortcut using technology, right? We know those terms as stargates or wormholes. And I think a lot of these things are either discoveries in space that you can, you can skip through in places, or they can maybe even be created through advanced technology. Look at CERN. I absolutely think that that's the purpose of CERN. CERN is a means of, of providing some kind of an artificial, either a, a stargate or some kind of a means to manipulate um, our dimensions and, and for, for like what they were maybe even practicing in, during like the ancient Atlantis and things like that. CERN has, I think people should really look at CERN. I think there's a lot of really interesting questions um, there. So... Gold has, is what you could call, call a superconductor, okay? It is the built, and, and a lot of these other metals too, like palladium and silver, um, there's, a whole, there's a whole host of these very rare um, elements that are essential in technology, okay? We could not go into space without gold, plain and simple. Gold has these, this atomic, um, these atomic properties that not only make it so that it, it's a superconductor and it reflects nearly 100% solar radiation, okay? Remember we were talking about aerosol sprays. Yes, you could aerosol gold and it would be extremely effective and it healthy, but it's obviously really expensive and they don't want to do that. But you can also use it in a, in a powder to use its atomic structure to have a means to extend, extend um, the cellular, cellular lifespan of a being. These are about 120 years. Does anybody wonder why humans always are always dying about the same time? You know, you you see all these old people in India and in Italy, and they're always like 115, 116, but there's never anybody that's over about 120 because our cell, our cellular structure is in such a way that they start to degrade and, and they, and they die. And we can't, that, that's why we can't live past that time. We were, our genetics were then downgraded later on. That's why the Sumerian Kings lived so long. Our genetic structure was downgraded so that we wouldn't live so long because we were living way too long, getting way too smart. If you have a being that has a limited mortality of only 120 years or less, obviously, in a lot of cases, people back in the day only lived to like 40 or 30, then they would have a very um, small amount of time to actually figure things out. They would have a small amount of time to actually understand things, but they would still be able to, 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 to work and do whatever they needed to in this world for energy. And that's how we should look at it is in terms of energy. You know, we're not all gold mining on the planet, but we are, there are a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world in Africa that are like still slaves for a lot of these elements that are taking these out. And, and what, what are we doing as, what are we doing as um, an advanced civilization? We're buying all that gold for materialistic purposes, dying, and then it just goes back to the same place it started with. Some pawn shop or some government place where they melt it down and it becomes bullion. Why is gold considered the value of our of our of our planet you can't you can't um you can't use it for any kind of a, a food really you can't unless you were an advanced civilization you couldn't use it for any for anything but technology or, or any of these other means so for it to become the standard of our of our consideration for what wealth is really in this planet is no means an accident 
to this day, the Rothschild family still, still determines the daily price of gold. That, it, those things cannot just be a complete coincidence. You know, that, that, that countries use that to define their own wealth and that it's, it's really the only form, one of the only, these are the only forms really of actual wealth. And it, to me, it just, it just connects with a lot of what has gone on in the past. Um, so we need to look at our solar system. We need to look at our universe, our Milky Way galaxy. We need to look at life in a completely different way and see that it's, it's based on sentient civilizations, you know, developing and then in some cases even being, um, being challenged by some beings that want them to go a certain direction. And then in other cases, maybe they're wiped out through their own war means and they're in there and they disappear and we never hear from them again. Um, it's, and it's very interesting. Where are these gods now? Well, I think a lot of them did leave during this period of when we became uh, aware to either just manipulate through higher dimensions and incarnate, or in some cases, some of them stayed behind. Like the being Thoth says that he's far below the great pyramids in the halls of Amente. He's in stasis, you know, because he's, he, incar he chose to not become immortal and to become man mankind's teacher to incarnate into beings like Hermes and all these different people all throughout history to become a teacher. So some of these, some of these gods and beings, they, they did stay behind because they want to help us. And, and then of course, look at what's happened. The war Eagle has essentially dominated and taken over our planet and destroyed whatever remnants of the serpent dragon existed. And now we just have these little pieces that, that are left from this, what was called the old religion back in the back way back in the day of, um, of when, of when these cultures knew all about this. So is, it should be in, interesting for some people to do a little information to find out that our moon is one of the largest moons per ratio size of our planet of any moon we know of. Okay. It's, it's almost, it's very strange that it, it, all aspects look that it was not put there. Um, it was put there somehow through artificial means. It's because yes, it's so been big that it, with the moon and it's an anomaly when it, within itself, you know, you only see one side and uh, exactly. yeah, please continue about that. I've, I've always been fascinated with the moon. It's what's called tidal locked. Okay. And um, most moons are not in anywhere near as an extreme tidal lock as our moon. And again, is that just a complete correlation? The fact that we have this giant mass that is much larger than most moons compared to its planet size and it's tidal locked in the backside the dark side never is, is seen. Boy, that sounds pretty perfect to monitor a planet, wouldn't it be? It sure Especially does. if you left and you left behind what, what we consider like a skeleton crew of, of beings to watch us. And that's why, that's specifically why in the Book of Enoch, go read that. That's why they call them the Watchers, okay? Because these beings just watch us. They monitor what's going on here. And then as above, so below, a lot of these kingships and, and these higher government um, aspects that still exist, they're still trying to do the work that existed long ago about maintaining control here, maintaining the control of the population and people working and keeping us in a constant state of war because war keeps not only a species in its lowest chakra, it, it, it causes chaos and doesn't allow for, um, for like a collective um, collaboration of people it keeps division and division is the key in this all this whole thing it's division 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 okay we went to the moon in 1969 supposedly i think we did but we but i think that we had to leave because we we saw things there that's why the clementine mission saw some strange things there too i do think that there are there are inner um areas in the moon because that's what these beings seem to love to do they love to be create things that are inside a planet and I think that they're just monitoring our, our world. And that's why we, we haven't gone back. We were essentially told not to come back. That's why we haven't gone back to the moon. Not because it's expensive, but because we saw really strange things there. That's why Buzz Aldrin and a lot of these astronauts, um, you know, they're drunks and they've all this, all these problems because they've, they've seen things and they've been told, look, if you talk about it, you know, you're, we're going to do all these various means that we do or ruin your life, whatever it is. And you, you'll be a, a, one of those suicides, right? And a, a lot of them have to have to go t towards the side of just drinking themselves or whatever it is because they just it's just trying to deal with reality in this in this extreme control that we live in. 
some people, you either understand that there are real conspiracies or you don't believe in any of them at all. That seems to be the model of how we go towards because of how our, our model of reality works. Um, but largely it's, it's, it's towards the side of, of, of control. Now, I want to go through a couple of quick stats on this because we're, we're pretty late right now, but um, Mars is one of these keys to understanding that things have happened in the past, okay? And I, I absolutely believe um, that there was, there was part of these ancient civilizations that maybe the Anunnaki created or they were part of with the Ajiji or maybe even human, humans that used to live there long ago, they were part of workers, who, who, regardless of what it was. Long ago on Mars, we see evidence for civilizations that used to exist there that were completely destroyed. And I don't just mean destroyed. I mean the entire atmosphere of the planet was destroyed. Um, and I want to get into that, talking about it in a minute, some of these signatures. But I want to go through a couple stats that's pretty amazing. Mars, smaller than Earth, and yet it has some of those incredible features that of anywhere in our solar system. Um, there's a mountain called Olympus Mon on Mars that's 72,000 feet tall. Mount Everest is just shy of 30,000 feet. So just imagine uh, the size the of the tallest, uh, the, the tallest mountain in our uh, solar system. That's right. And it's yeah. no coincidence that it was called Olympus in my mind. Because these gods, if you go back to Atlantis and the, and the, the battle that, ex that existed between the Olympians and the Titans, the Olympians were considered largely these, this second generation older, younger gods, whereas the Titans were largely made up of these older gods. And it was a struggle for which gods would dominate the Zodiac and civilizations. And... The Olympians were like Enlil and Ninurta, which was Apollo, and all these other gods who won. And that's why their names are everywhere, because they, and that's why they rule our reality. These war gods, these Olympian war gods, they rule our reality, and they, and they essentially, they're, they've colonized and they control our entire solar system. I think that there are moons off, off of Saturn and off of Jupiter that they're likely our entire bases that are watching us. All these very, very strange things that we're going to be shocked to learn in the future. A couple other things that may be amazing to people. There's a canyon on, on Mars that, is, that makes the Grand Canyon look like a little tiny dwarf. Um, it's called Valles Marineres, and it is 2,500 miles long. And to give you a little example, the Grand Canyon is 227 miles long. Okay, and this wow. canyon... Um, it, this canyon's six times deeper and it's 125 miles wide. It's, so there's these amazing features on the planet, okay? Not to mention that if, if we want to believe that some of these rovers that have gone to Mars are real, okay, if, if that's true, then some of the images they, that they've shown, like in 2014 with the Mars rover, they showed images, I've showed this before, with fossils on the, on the, on the planet, with uh, what are called ammonite fossils, shell fossils. You can see it in a lot of images, which are exactly like Earth, which means Earth and Mars are sharing similar species. And furthermore, it would talk about how Mars probably had largely a, um, a, a, a climate and life that was similar to Earth in the past, and something t d um, disastrous happened. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Mars has two moons. Phobos and Deimos, okay? And the planet has this red oxide hue across the whole thing. And that is not a coincidence, okay? That it's, it likely didn't look like that in the past exactly. That is actually reflection for what may have happened. And some people may think that that's crazy, but let me explain a couple of things. Uh, in 2012, there's a man named Dr. Brandenburg who I really highly, highly, rec highly recommend people look into. He's a genius, basically. Who's a, he's a plasma physicist, okay? Just think about what that is. Who worked with, he, had a, he has a PhD from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. And he worked for, to design advanced rocketry, rocketry for, um, for NASA, for the, for, for the moon and Mars, okay? Basically one of the smartest men on the, you know, on the planet. And yet now he can, he's considered a crackpot because of what he came up with for, dis for discoveries. At one point, he's considered a genius, and then he's, he's thrown under the bus and, and considered crazy. That's, you see that so often all throughout our time. So what, what happened? Well, Dr. Brandenburg was studying the environment of Mars, and he saw, because he wanted to, he had to figure out what the climate was so they could specifically land rockets, so they know of the makeup for what elements are in the atmosphere and all those different things. So he's studying the makeup using probes of the planet. And 
what he comes up with is pretty remarkable because he starts to see these extremely high concentrated what are called I nuclear isotopes, okay? Xenon isotopes that are only present after a nuclear weapon has gone off. They are impossible to be created in nature. So there's these signatures that can be left after nuclear weapons have gone off. That's another reason why in World War II, if you, if you read about when we started testing nuclear weapons, all of a sudden we had these strange visitations all over the place. And you had things like Roswell and all these, these events. Because there's a signature that goes off when a civilization detonates, and cre and detonates nuclear weapons that cannot be created any other means. So you, all you have to do is look for that signature. And Dr. Brandenburg found that signature all over the planet, not just in one place. But he found by analyzing the 2001 uh, Mars rover information, they found these radioactive, very, very high amounts of uranium, thorium, and potassium literally covering the entire surface soil of the whole planet. And what that means is that long ago, there was a nuclear war that likely happened, either from outside the surface, destroying it, or on the surface itself. And it was so destructive that it actually um, caused nuclear winds to pass across the whole planet, destroying every piece of life and, des and, and destroying the atmosphere. And then everything was basically blown into space, like, like a horror movie, like we see in these science fiction horror movies, with um, most of the water on the surface all evaporating and all, all that's left is either below the surface or on the ice caps. And that's why we see that today. Because there was destru absolutely destruction that occurred. I, probably more than 50,000 years ago, we don't know, on the planet that wiped out the entire thing. And it should be the greatest striking reminder we can have today for where we are now. For the idea that, that technology can literally cause a planet to die. And that should be a, a, a really, really um, strong thing that we should look at right now. That's why, that's why they're warning us so much of, of how devastating World War III could be. Could be. Um, and... Um, and of course, in 2001, you saw the Mars Global Surveyor go back and, and you had the 1970 images of the face on Mars that have all these shadows and stuff on it. And then they go back in 2001 and none of those shadows exist. You can't have shadows on an object that disappear. That doesn't make any sense unless that object was manipulated somehow or they manipulated the images. And that's exactly what I think happened. I think the face is real. You have things, you have um, pyramids that have been nicknamed D and M pyramids that are near that area. That's been called Cydonia. That was probably a, a city that was directly in the area of these nuclear attacks. And Brandenburg was talking about how if you look at the surface terrain of the planet, you can see some of where these impacts were. Just north of Cydonia, there are these massive craters where they have the highest amount of radiation around them multiple of these of these uh, of these nuclear weapons um, that had weapons that had gone off um, and so what that means is there's a there's a history that's gone on long before us in our solar system that we are just beginning to understand and our planet is 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 being fought over to see what our future will be at the same time governments around the world are trying to um, develop space technology we just saw this announcement by, by Trump with this formation of this military, you know, capability of the United States being developed in space. Basically, the future. Yeah. If we didn't already have technology in space, they would not be making announcements like that. I absolutely yeah. do believe that the secret space program is real. Um, I think that it started during World War II, and it's definitely connected with some of the technology that even, is even linking back to the Nazis, like in Ant Antarctica. All of this stuff is related to these breakaway advanced um, elite families and groups that had a lot of technology that probably was not given to them just by their means, probably from outside influences. And they developed technology way ahead of their time. And that's why we went to the moon in 1969 and were essentially kicked off. Okay. But that doesn't mean that in other places we're not, we're not, um, we don't have some kind of a, a capability in space. I think we have a lot more than they're telling us, not just the International Space Station and the ISS. But look at Elon Musk saying that we're going to be on Mars with, with like actual buildings and um, human cultures in only a few years. That would not be possible unless we're already on Mars, not rovers. 
but so basically if you look at how technology is being considered like something like more than 70 years behind what the public is told which is absolutely true it's being released in these certain timed events then it would mean that space technology is way advanced than what we think it is too and places like mars have likely already been colonized and with some of with with with, with areas and and we're just seeing you know these these people like Elon Musk that, that have tons of money who are trying to pioneer and push forward this science without coming right out to, to say what's there. Um, but look into Operation Paperclip. Look, look into some of this really strange Nazi technology that was, that was, garnered, that was, that was gathered from the U.S. military after World War, during World War II as it was ending. Um, and you can start to see that it's really correlated with a lot of this stuff. Um, and as we go forward in the future, we're going to have secrets come out that completely change our perspective of how we've been viewing all this stuff because we've been kept, kept so in the dark, so in the dark about all this stuff, planet nine, life in the universe, who these gods are, um, our genetic DNA and why we have these, this huge jumpstart in our brains and why we have all this, what's called junk DNA, which is actually non-coded DNA, which means they don't know where it came from. It, Non-coded DNA, which makes up a pretty good amount of our important DNA, it means that it's not coded, non-coding to any other species on this planet. That is impossible if, it's, if you follow the rules of Darwin, Darwinism with us coming from an ape. It doesn't make any sense that we would have DNA that's not found, found on any, anything else on this planet. Furthermore, if, in, like if apes were just simply us in a more advanced stage, that we would have seen some kind of an ape in our lifespan time period in human civilization that was going through some kind of a transition. Regardless of what that transition was, if that the whole story was true, you would see a, some kind of a slow transition, these transitions occurring with different stages. And yet we see nothing like that. There's apes and there's people. And there's a vast difference between them. So just because apes are one of the smartest animals on the planet doesn't mean that uh, and and, we're, and we are related to them. I mean, I, absolutely early hominids, Denisovians, Denisovians and Neanderthals are definitely related to these, these early primates. But, but, but the way we've been told about the means for how it's gone down with survival of the fittest and us all fighting and conquering, think about that. That's just like us saying that our human nature is simply warlike. It's a way to, to hide the, tr the true nature and, where, and where our ancient origins come from not, and, and, and not and, and to to make it believe that what's going on in the world is completely normal and justified, basically. You know what I mean, Chris? Yeah, and we, we definitely live in fascinating times right now. There's little grips of disclosure here and there about various things. I mean, you hear more about the UFO sighting, especially you know the Pentagon releasing yeah. files about it. We're definitely in some interesting times. I hope it's gonna go further. I hope the disclosure comes out even more. Well. And um, Matt, you had mentioned your book earlier. Tell us a little bit about that and what you got going on before you go. Okay, so I mentioned um, some of the content that's in it. I'm, and one of the reasons why I'm not doing as many YouTube shows, I, Chris, I really like Chris, so I wanted to do the show with him. Um, yeah. But um, I'm focusing almost all my time on finishing this book. I'm, I'm about 85% done, and I feel pretty confident that I can have it around the new year. I'm trying to get this thing out. I'm really, I really feel good about the direction it's going. It, it's much deeper than the first book and it delves with a lot of the questions I get all the time. It basically answers, talks all about, you know, the whole idea of what dimensions are, what the stage of our reality is here and how, you know, it's being fought over in the third dimension from above and below because it's this stage of third, third on um, the third dimension and human beings are, we are the means for how the third dimension is going to go because we're the ones that are, you know, we're the, we're the beings that are, that are controlling the decisions based on whatever influences that are, that are happening to us. Um, so the book is, is really discusses a lot about those, those answers. And, and it has translations from the Atrahasis, talks all about the Emerald Tablets, the Gnostic work with, with the Enochs, and it talks all about the Nag Hammadi scriptures. It really goes into what the ancient culture said and what the evidence is for, for these, these, these rulers of our reality, which is what Archon means that the Gnostics that's what they, that's what, that's what they called them. They're literally the rulers of our reality. And um, so I'm going to have that, this, it's called the stage of time. I'm going to get that done when I can with the best quality I can. I'm going to make sure it's really top notch, just um, no, nothing, no little grammatical problems or anything. And 
Um, in the meantime, I'm trying to do some shows. Um, go check out my channel at Matthew LaCroix on YouTube. I, I have a lot of stuff in there from the last couple of years. I've been really hammering um, material in there. And then lately I've been trying to finish um, the last, you know, six months to a year, I've been really trying to finish the book. But I, I really, um, above all, I ca all I care about is truth. And all the time I have people challenge me and I love it. Because okay. then it makes me both look at what I'm doing to see if I'm, if I'm correct on the, on the evidence. And as well as looking things in a different perspective. You know, there's definitely things that I've gotten a little, I've gotten wrong in the past that I've, I want, I want to come right out and just clearly say. And so this new book tackles some of those deeper, deeper questions and um, some of the more challenging aspects of these ancient writings and what, what they were trying to say and what some of the misconceptions are around them um, based on that. And I'm, I am taking a few leaps with some of them, but you, if you don't, then you're just going to be rehashing old stuff. So, um, so Chris, thank you so much for this awesome discussion. I, I always appreciate having these, these great talks with you. Oh, thank you for joining us. That was absolutely awesome. I'm going to have you back again. And uh, thanks again, Matt. That was great. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Well, you have a great night. We'll see you, you again too. soon.